today at the National Press Club, the Federal Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg. Fresh from delivering his fourth budget, the Treasurer is hoping he's helped burnish the Coalition's economic credentials ahead of the looming election campaign. Josh Frydenberg with today's National Press Club address. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the National Press Club and the Westpac Address, coming to you today from the Great Hall at Parliament House. My name is Laura Tingle, and I'm the club's president. This will be the fourth time our guest has given the traditional post-budget address, and the third time he will be doing so at a time of crisis. In the past few hours, levees have broken, and streets, businesses, and homes have been flooded in northern New South Wales, some for a devastating second time. Our thoughts are with the poor people who are enduring the latest wave of this disaster. The flooding crisis, however, only highlights how pandemic and natural disasters have raised the demands on and the role of government in people's lives, and about how climate change is affecting us, whether politicians address it or not. The cost of living may have been the headline issue in last night's budget, but I'm sure journalists today will have lots more questions of the Treasurer on these broader issues. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Treasurer, Josh Frydenberg. Well, thank you very much, Laura, and can I echo your sentiments about um, the devastating floods that are affecting our communities? Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I would also like to acknowledge my colleagues in the room, too many to mention, but particularly Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce, Maurice Payne, the Finance Minister Simon Birmingham, who's been a great partner uh, in this year's budget, to the Assistant Treasurer Michael Suka and to the Assistant Minister for Superannuation um, and Financial Services and Financial Technology, Jane Hume. Can I also acknowledge the Secretary of the Department of Treasury, Stephen Kennedy, uh, and Rosemary Huxtable, two of the finest public servants of their generation who have been outstanding in their roles through the most difficult of times, so thank you very much. Also here today is my very good friend, Greg Hunt, who is departing politics, but who can hold his head very high after an incredible job as Health Minister. He has with him today a very special guest, a lady called Julie Sinney, who is the founder and the CEO of Spinal Muscular Atrophy Australia. Julie tragically lost both her children to spinal muscular atrophy and has led the charge to list Zolgesma on the PBS. A life-saving and a life-changing drug. Gene therapy to treat infants under the age of nine months. Last night, we listed this drug on the PBS at a record $2.5 million for a one-off treatment. This is the most expensive drug Australia has ever listed on the PBS. It will save 30 children a year and listing drugs like Zogelsma and last night Trevelvi to treat breast cancer patients is only possible because of a strong economy. And I would like to join you in acknowledging Julie and thanking her for her amazing advocacy to have this project. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we live in extraordinary times. A global pandemic has taken more than six million lives. All too frequent natural disasters are devastating local communities. And war in Ukraine has shattered peace in Europe and precipitated a global inflation spike. But despite all the challenges we face, Australia remains resilient and Australians remain strong. In just a few weeks' time, our nation goes to the polls. 
voters will face a clear choice. A Liberal National Coalition led by Scott Morrison that has delivered a world-leading economic recovery and now has outlined its long-term plan to create more jobs. And a Labor Party led by Anthony Albanese that has largely hidden from view for the last three years, trying to sneak into government with little more than a false and fanciful promise that he would govern like Bob Hawke and John Howard. The opposite would be true. The most left-wing Labor leader since Gough Whitlam, who has spent his entire political career championing higher taxes and higher spending. It's a history the Leader of the Opposition wants to conveniently forget. Ladies and gentlemen, over the last two years, Australians have been tested and there have been setbacks along the way. But we have got the big calls right. Closing our borders in early 2020, which saw Australia avoid the makeshift morgues of Central Park in New York. Implementing JobKeeper, which saved more than 700,000 jobs and put a security blanket across the economy. Responsible tapering and ending of emergency economic support so that crisis level spending was not baked in, nor continue any longer than necessary. The verdict is now in. Australia has seen an economic recovery that is faster and stronger than the United States, than the United Kingdom, than France, than Germany, than Canada, than Italy, and Japan. A double dose vaccination rate of more than 95%, which puts us in the top 10 of the OECD. A mortality rate, which per head of population is the third lowest in the OECD. This was not luck. More than 1,000 individual decisions across all areas of government that have put our economy in the strong position it is today. It is our record. And last night, I set out our plan for an even stronger future. A future where aspiration and enterprise are encouraged and rewarded. Where families have greater flexibility and choice. Where those in need get a helping hand where greater self-reliance leaves our nation less vulnerable. Today, I would like to make four key points. Outlining first how far our economy has come over the last two years, avoiding the economic abyss. Second, how last night's budget banked the dividend of a stronger economy with a material improvement to the budget bottom line. Third, how our plan delivers cost of living relief now and long-term investments in skills, small business, manufacturing, infrastructure, the regions and the digital economy to create even more jobs. And fourth, how we are investing more in national security and defence as the global threats to Australia and the world increase. As we gather here today, we are reminded of just how far we have come. In early 2020, Australia faced its biggest economic shock since the Great Depression. Around 1.4 million people or a little more than 10% of our workforce, lost their jobs or were stood down on zero hours in early 2020. Our economy shrank by an unprecedented 6.8% in the June quarter. To put this in context for you, prior to this, the largest quarterly fall in GDP 
was 2% back in 1974. GDP fell just 0.5% during the GFC. People were confined to their homes. The economy was put into hibernation and our lives were put on hold. Treasury feared that the unemployment rate could reach as high as 15%. And Labor said the biggest test for the Morrison government's management of the recession would be what happens to jobs and unemployment. Today, Australia's unemployment rate is at 4%, the equal lowest in 48 years. Female unemployment is at its lowest level since 1974. Two million more Australians are now in work than when we came to government. Our economic plan is working. Last night's budget demonstrates that our economy now has real momentum. Growth is higher, unemployment is lower, and wages are strengthening. Real GDP is expected to grow by 4.25% in 21-22 and 3.5% in 22-23. Unemployment is forecast to hit 3.75% by the September quarter and be sustained at that level, the lowest in 50 years. Wages have been upgraded in every year of the forecasts and the wages price index is expected to reach 3.25% next year, the strongest in almost a decade. Broader measures of wages are also picking up more quickly. The national accounts measure of wages growth is expected to increase by 5% over the year to June 2022. Inflation is forecast in Australia to increase to four and a quarter percent next year before declining over the estimates period. This is well below that of the United States where inflation is at a 40 year high of 7.9%. And the United Kingdom, Canada and New Zealand where inflation is running around 6%. We are now banking the dividends of a stronger economy. By the end of the forward estimates, the bottom line will improve by more than $100 billion. That is since my EFO alone. The budget shows the fastest and strongest improvement to the bottom line in Australia in over 70 years. More people in work, fewer people on welfare, repairing the budget without increasing taxes. At the same time, we are guaranteeing the essential services that Australians rely on, with record funding for schools, for hospitals, Medicare, mental health, aged care, disability support, and last night, a further $2 billion of new measures to improve the safety, the health, and the economic security of women. There are further investments in the environment as we transition to net zero emissions by 2050. In this budget, almost three quarters of the revenue improvement is due to a stronger economy and particularly a stronger labour market. Not the product of baking in high commodity price assumptions, a weakness of Labor's previous budgets. We have maintained a tax to GDP cap of 23.9%. Constraining revenue imposes a discipline on the expenditure side of the budget and is consistent with our values of cutting taxes, not increasing them. It is then no surprise that Labor has no such discipline and no such tax cap. 
having promised $387 billion in higher taxes going into the last election, which would have seen the tax to GDP ratio reach a record high of 25.9%. On the expenditure side, our approach has also been different to our political opponents. When we ended JobKeeper, the opposition leader said the economic roof would come crashing down. Three months later, nearly 120,000 more people were in work. When we ended the COVID disaster payments, the shadow finance minister said that support should not be pulled. A month later, we had the strongest monthly increase in employment on record. They could not have been more wrong. Keeping the spending taps on would have been irresponsible. And our political opponents have made $80 billion of further spending commitments during COVID. This is in stark contrast to the approach that we adopted in last night's budget. Spending as a share of GDP is lower than what was projected at MyEFO by the end of the forward estimates and across the medium term. A prudent approach that avoids putting unnecessarily upward pressure on interest rates. By sticking to our fiscal strategy, gross debt peaks four years earlier and 5.4 percentage points lower than what was previously forecast. Our debt to GDP ratio is less than half of that across G7 economies and around half of that in the United States and Japan. And we remain one of only nine countries in the world to have retained a AAA credit rating from the three leading credit rating agencies. This was again affirmed last night, with S&P confirming our AAA stable rating and acknowledging in their statement Australia's economic recovery is improving the government's fiscal strategy trajectory faster than was previously anticipated. Ladies and gentlemen, the number one topic of conversation around the kitchen tables of Australia right now is cost of living. COVID and events in Ukraine have disrupted global commodity markets and supply chains, driving up the prices of food and fuel. This is a global phenomenon impacting us here at home. The price of oil is up by 50% since the start of the year. Wheat prices are up by 40% since the start of the year. And shipping costs today are more than five times what they were pre-COVID. The budget I, hand I handed down last night responds directly to these pressures in a temporary, in a targeted and in a responsible way. Halving fuel excise for six months, which could save a family with two cars who fill up once a week $700. A temporary $420 cost of living tax offset for over 10 million low and middle income earners. A new one-off $250 cost of living payment to 6 million Australians, including pensioners, veterans, carers and others on income support, concession card holders, including self-funded retirees. Greater access to cheaper medicines for 2.4 million Australians who will now require fewer scripts before they see their medicines either free or at a concessional rate. These measures will provide real relief to Australian families at a time when they need it most. And this comes on top of more than $40 billion in tax relief that our government has provided since the start of the pandemic alone. Lower energy costs have fallen nearly 10% in the last two years and reduced childcare costs for around 250,000 families as a result of measures I announced in last year's budget. Last night's budget not only responds to the pressures of the here and now, it also outlines a long-term plan 
a vision for Australia to create more jobs and a more resilient economy. Critical reforms to upskill a new generation of young Australians. Bold new investments in regions of national significance. Expanding Australia's sovereign manufacturing capability. Boosting the competitiveness of our small and large businesses with new investments in infrastructure, energy and the digital economy. And it will be these new investments that will help secure our pathway to net zero emissions by 2050 and respond to the critical global challenge of climate change. During the pandemic, the government invested $13 billion into skills and training, helping to deliver a record 220,000 Australians into a trade apprenticeship, the highest number on record. In last night's budget, we committed a further $2.8 billion to support even more apprentices. And we also lay the foundation for national skills reform with a $3.7 billion investment supporting another 800,000 training places. We understand that no one knows better than a small business owner the skills that they need in their employees. And last night's budget incentivises and rewards small business for helping their employees to upskill. For every $100 a small business spends on training their employees, they will get a $120 tax deduction, effectively lowering the cost of training for small businesses. Ladies and gentlemen, 270,000 new jobs were advertised across the country in February. By investing in new and expanded programs to help disadvantaged youth, Indigenous Australians, the mature aged, the Australian, Australians with a disability, and helping them all find employment will help more Australians make the most of these opportunities. Equipping our workforce with better skills, making our economy stronger, more innovative, and more productive. This is our plan for a stronger future. Nowhere are these opportunities more abundant than in our strong and in our growing regions. Accounting for two thirds of our exports, regional Australia is already a powerhouse of the economy. No government understands this more. We've committed a record $100 billion to our regions since coming to government. And this budget outlines an even more ambitious vision for our regions, leveraging the strengths and proximity to new and growing markets, we will invest in nation-building infrastructure to transform our regions and prime them for further growth. Through targeted investments in land and water infrastructure, low emissions technology and energy generation, resources extraction and processing, we will open up these new frontiers of production and growth. And these landmark investments will help create the next chapter of Australia's economic story. Growing Australia's manufacturing sector will also be key to creating more jobs and making our economy more resilient. In last night's budget, we are providing almost $330 million for manufacturing businesses that eliminate vulnerabilities across our key supply chains. We have secured the manufacturing of mRNA vaccines in Victoria, one of only a handful of countries in the world to have this capability. And we continue to invest in our modern manufacturing strategy, setting out a 10-year blueprint to expand Australia's sovereign manufacturing capability. Medical products, recycling and clean energy, critical minerals, defence, space and food. Last night, I also announced the extension and expansion of our patent box regime, which taxes income from homegrown patents developed by medical and biotech firms at around half the normal company tax rate. Agriculture and low emissions technology businesses will now also benefit, further supporting the commercialisation of Australia's technologies is part of our plan to see Australia become a leading digital economy by 2030. 
Australia has already seen the emergence of exciting new high-tech companies. Afterplay, Afterpay, Atlassian, Canva, Seek and many more. But every Australian a company is now a digital company. And that is why we've invested more than $3.5 billion in digital initiatives since 2020. And why in this budget we are delivering a new technology investment boost, which will provide a $120 tax deduction for every $100 small businesses spend on computer hardware, software and other digital technologies, up to $100,000 in expenditure each year. Our plan will help businesses to grow, lift their productivity and become more competitive and at the same time make us less reliant on global supply chains. Finally, there is no more important time to strengthen our national security and defence. And this budget does exactly that. Australia, whether we like it or not, faces a less stable region in the years ahead. And we face a more uncertain world. Autocracies are challenging the liberal rules-based order that has underpinned prosperity in the world since the end of the Second World War. What Russia is doing today is not just challenging the international rules-based order, but will substantially change the trajectory of globalisation. The stakes are high. Strategic competition is on the rise. Economic coercion is more pronounced. Critical supply chains are under pressure. Today, national security and economic security are intrinsically linked. Since coming to government, we have lifted defence spending from less than 1.6% of GDP to around 2% of GDP and growing. We have put in place a $270 billion defence capability plan supporting more than 100,000 Australian jobs across the supply chain. And in the past fortnight, we have announced our plans to expand the size of our defence workforce to more than 100,000 at a cost of $38 billion. To build a new submarine base on the east coast of Australia as part of a more than $10 billion investment in future submarine infrastructure. And last night, we announced a record $9.9 .9 billion 10-year plan to invest in Australia's offensive and defensive cyber capabilities. More data analysts, computer programmers, software engineers to boost our capacity to respond to cyber threats. Make no mistake, if an adversary is able to knock out Australia's banking, energy, or telecommunication system, they are halfway to victory. We're also building stronger strategic partnerships. We have been doing this through AUKUS, the Quad, ASEAN, and the Five Eyes Network. Australia must always be in a position to stand up for our values, and this budget will ensure that we are in that position to do so. After nearly 30 years of uninterrupted economic growth, COVID stopped the Australian economy in its tracks. It was the biggest economic shock since the Great Depression. And while our economy has recovered strongly, we should not lose sight of how far we have come. Just on two years ago, 
we were literally staring into the economic abyss. Now our economy leads the world. Growth is higher, unemployment is lower, and wages are strengthening. We are on track for an unemployment rate at three and three quarter percent. And we are seeing a material improvement to our budget bottom line. Our economic plan is working and now is not the time to change course. Now is not the time to put all those gains at risk. The budget last night delivers cost of living relief now, a long-term economic plan to create more jobs. It guarantees the essential services that Australians rely on, and it invests more in national security and defence at a time where the world is dramatically changing. This is a budget for the times, and this budget will deliver a strong economy and a stronger future. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Treasurer. Um, if I could take you uh, to pages, uh, sorry. I was going to say that for Morris Riley. He always loves it when I go to the budget papers. Um, but if uh, you've mentioned the uh, huge step up in defence spending in your speech, and on the spending side, the budget papers show spending stabilising at over 26% of GDP in 2025 and staying there until 2032-33, which is in 10 years' time. Now, spending at these levels was last this consistently high 40 years ago. Yet in last night's budget, you haven't allowed for any big increases in spending in government services like hospitals and aged care, new discretionary measures, which have been found to be so wanting in the pandemic. There are increases there, but you haven't talked about new measures to address what's happened in the pandemic. Nor have you set out how you might cut spending in the medium term. On the tax side, the budget papers show the uh, tax collection, collections miraculously tracking to the 23.9% of GDP for the next decade, which the government says is its target. The bottom line here is that based on your own figures, there is a massive shortfall between the cost of government services post-COVID mm -hmm. and the revenue you will have to pay for them, equivalent to about 2% of GDP. Why aren't we having a discussion in this pre-election budget about what we'll have to give? Is it really possible to think you can cut spending significantly when we have an ageing population? Or should you be being honest with people and saying that the tax take is going to have to eventually rise to cover this shortfall? Well, thank you very much, um, Laura. And you're right, there has been substantial increases in the major areas, for example, like health and aged care. So, for example, since 2012-13, funding for aged care has doubled from 13.3% billion dollars to be $29.8 billion in 22-23. We've seen similar major investments in mental health. Last budget we announced a $2.2 billion investment in health. The NDIS effectively spending has doubled since we've come to government. You've now got 500,000 people on the NDIS and the federal government is providing the majority of that funding support. What our focus is on being, has been on is growing the economy, growing the pie, so that those deficits re reduce as a share of GDP. And what we have seen in the budget last night is that the deficits more than halve over the period of the forward estimates and then more than halve again by the end of the medium term. But you're right. At the end of the medium term, there's still a 0.7% gap between the receipts and the payments. Our focus to meet that gap over the coming period is going to be about growing that pie. That is how we're going to um, ensure that we can pave and guarantee those essential services that people rely on. And that's why we bring in projects like the investment in the regions, a $21 billion program across everything from water and transport infrastructure to telecommunications and health to the regional accelerator program, which Bridget um, is leading the charge on, which uses existing programs, but in manufacturing, in skills, in recycling, in, in, um, in, in a whole series of areas, export development grants. By investing in our regions, we can unlock those new frontiers of economic 
um, productivity and growth, and then we can grow our economy in order to generate more income. I want to also underline the fact that the budget improvement that we have seen last night has been the result largely of a stronger labour market. The fact that the unemployment rate today is at 4% is far better than what Treasury were forecasting. Um, not just at the height of the pandemic, even since. It's been better than even our most optimistic expectations. And as a result, our revenues have gone up from income tax and our expenditure from welfare payments has gone down. So there are some um, you know, important developments occurring across the economy where we are being required to spend more on aged care, NDIS and defence. Uh, and we also are dealing with an ageing population which does see uh, higher demands on our health system more generally. But by growing the pie, we can, as we showed last night, reduce our deficits as a share of the economy and steadily do that over time. Next question is from Phil Curry. Thanks, Laura. Um, hi, Mr Frydenberg. Um, just back to bring you back to the short term um, and the petrol excise cut. I just want to know, should you win the election, um, can you conceive any circumstance under which you would extend that cut, especially, say, the forecast in the budget about the price of oil dropping as it forecast by September, not eventuating, or is that is it is it locked and loaded six months only? We've been very clear, Phil, it's only six months. Um, in other countries, they've done it for different periods of time. In New Zealand, they did it for three months. In countries in Europe, they did it for four and five months. We've done it for six months. We've done it at just above 22 cents a litre. In New Zealand, they did it at 25 cents a litre, for example. Um, this is a $3 billion hit to the budget bottom line. But actually what Treasury say is that the reduction in the fuel excise will reduce inflation by a quarter of a percentage point. So it will actually reduce inflation as, about, as opposed to leading, increasing inflation. That will be welcome. But the reason why we took this um, step, Phil, was because the cost of living pressures are real, fuel prices are particularly high, and Treasury have forecast that the price of a barrel of oil will come down to $100, as you say, by the end of the September period. So the legislation will be very clear. Um, this cut will end on the 28th of September. It will sunset at that time, and it won't be uh, extended. Mark Riley. Mark Riley, Treasurer from the Seven Network. I want to take you to the $420 cost of living offset which we paid after uh, July 1, uh, and then the entire offset of up to $1,500 is abolished. Yet the cost of living, according to the budget and all forecasts, continues to rise. Doesn't that mean that you go to this election with a promise to effectively increase taxes on 10 million Australians earning under $126,000 a year by $1,500 at a time when the cost of living is rising? The answer is a very clear no. Uh, when Lamito was first introduced, it was part of a plan to merge with what is our stage th uh, a three-stage tax reduction plan. We then only e extended it because we were in the COVID crisis as a fiscal stimulus. It was never meant to be a permanent feature of the tax system, just as when Rudd and Labor put in place the $900 checks. That was for a certain period of time. The Lamito was for a certain period of time. But what we have done is put in place long-term structural tax reform. We have legislated more than $300 billion of tax relief with the final stage taking place in 24-25, which abolishes the 37 cents in the dollar tax bracket sees 95% of taxpayers pay more, no, no more than 30 cents in the dollar and creates a much fairer and simpler tax system. While we're on tax, we've also put in place the immediate expensing provisions. We've also put in place the loss carry back provisions. We've cut small business taxes to the lowest level in 50 years and last night we extended to um, tax incentives to small business. So after 22, 23, taxpayers, will be, if they're in that bracket of up to $90,000, they'll be $1,080 better off 
than they would have been under the Labor Party. They'll pay less taxes under us. That is what our plan is. Lamito was only meant to be temporary. Chris Yorman. Treasurer Chris Yorman, Nine News. Um, looking across the forward estimates, at no stage does the government spending drop under 26 per cent. Mm -hmm. At no stage in the next decade do you forecast a surplus. Gross debt is heading towards a trillion dollars. Mm -hmm. When it was a fraction of that, you called it a debt and deficit disaster under Labor. You said they'd broken the Burkean compact of society, which is a bargain between the living, the dead, and those yet to be born. Why isn't that the case with you? And as you're answering, can you contemplate for a moment, would you accept the answer if it came out of the mouth of Wayne Swan? Well, nothing we'd say would be the same, so I don't uh, accept, I don't accept that. Um, Look, the first thing is people, and this is why I dwelt on this at the start of the speech, Chris, people have to understand the scale of the economic shock that we face. So we did balance the budget for the first time in 11 years going to the pandemic. That helped build a bit of the fiscal buffers that we could then use to respond as we needed. Um, global GDP contracted during COVID 3.1%. Global GDP contracted during the GFC by 0.1%. 3.1% for COVID, 0.1% for the GFC. That underscores the extent of the shock. Our economy effectively went into hibernation. I didn't become the treasurer and think I was gonna put in place an economy-wide wage subsidy at a flat $1,500 a fortnight at a cost of $90 billion. I never contemplated that. A cash flow boost of more than $30 billion, doubling the safety net with the coronavirus supplement, having to pay to under, underpin and underwrite freight routes across the country because people weren't taking domestic flights. We took more than 1,000 decisions in response to the biggest economic shock since the Great Depression, and of course, the debt burden is higher as a result. But at the first opportunity, we were taking the chance to reduce and then taper and then, and then stop those emergency support payments, and we were criticised for them. Now that the economy is normalising, you're starting to see the benefit of that strong economy to the budget bottom line. Gross debt, Chris, actually peaks at more than five percentage points lower and four years earlier in last night's budget than it did at my EFA. Deficits more than half over the forward estimates and then more than half again over the medium term. So I accept that we incurred higher spending during this crisis. I accept that we are spending more than our predecessors on the NDIS, aged care and defence. But I put it to you, what was the alternative? And now we have taken those steps and are seeing a repairing of the economy. It's got a long way to go but we're doing it without increasing taxes. The same can't be say, said about those opposite. Andrew Probin. Treasurer Andrew Probin from the ABC. My, one, my question sort of flows, flows on from Chris's. Um, you've got uh, two deficits in the order of $80 billion in a, in a row. On the other side of the Nullarbor, Mark, Mal <laughs> uh, Mark, <laughs> Mark McGowan is going to um, unveil a deficit, a, a surplus, surplus, sorry, of about $8 billion, yeah. which is probably, well, I think it is the biggest surplus in Australian state history. Two and a half billion of that is money that you gave Mark McGowan under this GST deal. Two billion of that came from your home state. Now, before your answer, and that is that no one could lose and that you, you topped up every other state and territory that did lose, that's going to cost federal taxpayers $17 billion over the next four years. But that deal ends soon, so your state could go backwards, many other states and territories could go backwards for what is clearly a pretty ordinary piece of public policy. What do you say to Victorians and what do you say to the, the rest of Australia for having to stump up so many billions of dollars to a state that's doing, thank you very much, very well. Well, the first thing I'd say to Victorians is, if you look at the budget papers last night, 
they received more money in GST than the previous year. And we have actually seen about $11 billion extra in GST payments through last night's budget. It's not insubstantial. GST's been going up. What I'd say to the people of Western Australia is it was a coalition government, a government with then Treasurer Scott Morrison, now Prime Minister Scott Morrison, that righted a wrong. It was wrong that the people of Western Australia could see just 30 cents in a dollar return to them from the GST. That is wrong. So what we did is we set a floor at 70 per cent, 70 cents in the dollar. And yes, we dug into our coffers to fund that. But one of the reasons why Western Australia is now seeing a surplus, or two reasons why Western Australia is now seeing a surplus, one is because they didn't have the broad scale lockdowns that Victoria did, which were an absolute disaster in my home state, the longest lockdown city anywhere in the world was the state of Melbourne. And on a per capita basis, we provided more economic support through COVID to Victoria than any other state. More on a per capita basis to the state of Victoria than any other state. In Western Australia, they did not have those large scale lockdowns and therefore they did not see the detrimental economic impact that we saw in Victoria. The other reason why Western Australia is seeing a strong bottom line is of course because of commodities. Iron ore today is $140 a tonne. I have it in the budget at $55 a tonne. If commodity prices stay where they are for another six months, it will be worth $30 billion more to a bud our budget bottom line. We get federal company tax receipts, they get state royalties. And so this money is underpinning the Western Australian budget. And we took a very conservative position, Andrew, in last night's budget with respect to commodity prices. Metallurgical coal is trading today at $600 a tonne. We had it in the budget at $130 a tonne. Thermal coal is trading today at $300 a tonne. We have it in the budget at $60 a tonne. Iron ore today is trading at $140 a tonne. We had it in the budget at $55 a tonne. We did not do what Labor did, baking in long-term commodity price assumptions that were elevated just because they were at a point in time. We righted the wrong for Western Australia. We ensured that they could get at a minimum 70 cents in the dollar. That was the best thing to do. Andrew Clonell. Mr Treasurer, Andrew Clonell from Sky News. You and the Prime Minister say the election is about a choice. Mm -hmm. In November, the Prime Minister said that you could pay more for petrol and have higher interest rates under Labor. The budget papers yesterday said monetary policy is expected to begin to normalise from historically low levels in a tightening cycle from 2022 to 2024, meaning there's going to be interest rate rises, several, no matter who's in power. The price of petrol was historically high even before the war in Ukraine. You and the Prime Minister also say under Labor the spending never stops. You're the highest spending treasurer in Australia's history, having spent 314 billion in stimulus, topped up by this $8 billion cost of living package. So you say there's a choice. What is the choice? Is it high spending, high petrol prices, rising interest rates versus the same? Well, the choice is very clear. Our government has delivered lower taxes, as we promised at the, to the Australian people at the last election. Labor and Anthony Albanese said at that time that they had a strong mandate for superannuation taxes, retiree taxes, housing taxes, higher income taxes and family business taxes. We did what we said we would do. Now after their election loss, suddenly they no longer believe in what they said was a core principle for them. 
We have delivered one of the fastest and strongest economic recoveries in the world and no one can take that away from 26 million Australians. Our economic plan has worked. We have guaranteed the essential services by fully funding Medicare, fully funding the NDIS, seeing aged care funding uh, increase dramatically, $17.7 .7 billion in last year's budget after the Royal Commission. Andrew, we have taken the steps that we promised to the Australian people we would at the last election. The Leader of the Opposition is pretending to be someone he is not. He has always stood for higher taxes. He has always stood for higher spending. In fact, they've made $80 billion of extra commitments on everything as silly as $6 billion to, get a jet, to have a jab, even though you've had a jab. They wanted to pay you an extra $300. They wanted JobKeeper to be extended when we knew it was the time to end it. So I think there's a very clear choice for the Australian people in the next election. Our government has delivered on what we said we would do. We've laid out our plan for the future. Labor is trying to sneak into government, not telling us what they really want to do. And this is where I'll finish on this one. Jim Chalmers, my political opponent, said a few days ago that Labor wanted to be flexible around tax. What does flexible mean? He said Labor will deliver a budget before the end of the year if they are successful. What does that mean? The budget document is our plan that we will take to the Australian election. The Australian people deserve to know what is Labor's plan that will be in their so-called budget before the end of the year. Thursday night is Anthony Albanese's opportunity he can't just carp on and character assassinate. He needs to show the Australian people what his plan is. And I doubt he will. So I think that's the test. Show us the plan. We showed you yours, ours, and we did that last night. Thank you. Michelle Grattan. Michelle Grattan from The Conversation. Treasurer, if you're re-elected, some of your supporters will want the first budget of a new term to be a very tough one, to advance fiscal repair much more strongly. They'll want a pale version of 2014. Can you tell us something of how you see that first budget of a new term? And what would you be saying to those urges who say, go hard? Well, I've done three budgets in 18 months, so I'm not looking forward to the next one in a hurry. Um, uh, look, I don't want to get ahead of ourselves, Michelle. My focus is on winning the election, explaining to the Australian people the, the granular detail in this budget, the cost of living relief now, the long-term economic plan, the guarantee of the essential services, the further investments in defence, and the dividend from banking the banking and the dividend of a stronger economy with historic low unemployment. Our plan is set out in the budget. That is our plan. They are our policies. As I said, our political opponents haven't told us what their plan or their policies are. And I'd say to our supporters that you referenced, in this budget, there are policies that speak to their very values. Lower taxes, that's what coalitions believe in. We've delivered it. More first home owners, 160,000 over the last year. The five year average, the 10 year average has been around 100,000 a year. Supporting seniors with the support that we've provided for self funded retirees on everything is the drawdown rates to, to the other programs to allow them to sell down their home and secure their retirement. Small business is totemic for the coalition, and again, there were measures in last night's budget, as well as the lower tax rates. And of course, we're a Liberals national coalition. We believe in the regions and the intrinsic power of the regions to supercharge Australia's growth as they already do. So we've invested more in the regions. So there's a lot in this budget that speaks to the coalition's values. And of course, you layer upon that the improvement to the budget bottom line and fiscal responsibility, and that is what my response would be. Thank you. Sarah Martin. 
Thank you, Treasurer Sarah Martin from The Guardian. Uh, you've happily told us that inflation would be a quarter of a percentage point higher without the fuel excise cut. Um, can you tell us how much lower it, uh, inflation would be over this year and next without the extra 5.6 billion of stimulus that you're putting into the economy through the Lamido boost and the cash payments? Um, and can you tell us what advice you received from the RBA about what effect that might have on interest rates? Well, the first thing is that the Treasury do work with the RBA in assessing the forecasts. So there is good coordination at departmental level. The measures you reference are actually part of the forecasts in the budget. And we do see inflation at four and a quarter percent this year, but that is driven, according to Treasury, largely by those international factors that I was pointing to. Higher food prices, higher transport costs, higher fuel prices. Inflation then comes down in Treasury's own forecast to 3%. And that is below the wages price index at 3.25%. And then inflation comes down again and the wages price index um, strengthens again. So it's all there in our forecasts. But I do point out to you, Sarah, that that $8.6 billion package is, in cumulative terms, less than half a percentage point of GDP. So people have to keep in mind the size of the Australian economy. These were very temporary, targeted, responsible measures. This was designed to help people at a time that they needed it most. It built on what we'd already announced, like the Lamito, which people get from the 1st of July, like the um, cuts, the, the electricity um, uh, investments have seen prices come down, like the changes of $1.7 billion in last year's budget on childcare. Peter Van Onselen. Peter Van Onselen, Network 10. Uh, early on in the pandemic, Treasurer, you promised to commence budget repair once unemployment was below 5%. Uh, as you've been bragging about uh, throughout the budget, uh, it's now at 4%, but there hasn't been any budget repair. Uh, any improvements in the budget bottom line, as you pointed out in your speech today, are not because of budget repair. Why did you decide to break that promise? And do you think Conchetta Ferravanti wells can stay on the Senate ticket for the coalition, given that she thinks that Scott Morrison is unfit to be Prime Minister? Well, let me deal with that second one first. Um, the members of the Liberal Party, 500 of them, made a dis decision on pre-selections on the weekend, and that decision stands, and obviously I disagree uh, with, uh, with her assessment um, uh, of the Prime Minister, a person who I've worked really well with, and I think he's led Australia um, extraordinarily well through a very, very challenging time for Australia, and the record is there for everyone um, to, to, to see. In relation to our fiscal strategy, initially I set it out at 6%. And then we transitioned, I said, to back to where we were going into the pandemic with the unemployment rate, which was around 5.1%. But we decided to target this historic low equivalent of effectively full employment. That became a target for us in the fiscal strategy. And we have delivered. And if you look at our fiscal strategy in the budget, it makes it very clear that our goal is to stabilise and then reduce debt as a share of the economy. And that is what you saw, Peter, in last night's budget. As I've said repeatedly, when gross debt gets to 44% of GDP, that is more than five percentage points lower than what we forecast in my EFO and four years earlier than what we forecast. Net debt peaks at around 33% of GDP. These are historically uh, higher numbers, but they're a reflection of the challenges that we face, but they're also significantly below that of other commensurate countries. So all that was about fiscal strategy was driving down the unemployment rate lower, getting us to the point where we could stabilise and then reduce debt as a share of the economy. That's what the budget papers last night show. Patrick Commons. Thanks, Treasurer. Patrick Cummins from the Australian newspaper. Um, you said the verdict is in, in terms of Australia's outperformance during the pandemic. You say we're the envy of the world. And all the numbers in the budget would suggest that. Treasury's forecast, we've got unemployment rate falling below 4%. 50 year low, you've got $100 billion improvement on the bottom line. Wage growth coming in at a decade high, expected to come in. 
And, and yet, you know, so by any objective measure, the, the economy is booming, and yet this doesn't seem to be translating into political advantage. Why do you think this is? And what are you as Treasurer going to do between now and the election to change Australians' minds? Well, it wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be uh, inappropriate for me to remind you of what happened back in 2019, when we were written off across the across the board in the media and the obituary was written and people said it wasn't a question of who would win but by how much. History told a very stru different story. And our focus has always been to get on with the job. And last night, what I sought to do in the budget was deliver the cost of living relief that I know Australians need now to lay out that long-term economic plan for the future, to guarantee the essential services which everyone relies on, and of course to invest more in national security and defence given the times that we face. So the people of Australia will make their decision come the election. That will be their decision. But from now to then, and hopefully after then, I will spend my time explaining why we have the best economic plan at the most challenging of times to create a strong economy and an even stronger future for them. David Crow. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Treasurer. David Crow from the Age of Melbourne and the Sydney Morning Herald. I want to pick up on two of your answers, the first to Andrew Clennell and then your answer to Michelle Grattan. When Andrew Clennell asked about the contrast between the political parties, you challenged Labor about what its future budget would be. But when Michelle Grattan asked you about what your next budget would be, you ducked it completely. Now, we have a budget today that shows that you can spend on National Party projects over 11 years, you can spend on cyber security over 10 years, you can cut taxes over 10 years, but you cannot show a surplus over the next 10 years. In your next budget, do you have what it takes to bring that under control and to find a way to surplus? Is that what you would do in your next budget? Well, David, I laid out a budget last night for now. Labor hasn't laid out an economic plan for now. So it's only their next budget because they should be telling the Australian people now what I told the Australian people last night. That would be like for like. They tell the Australian people what their plans are now. I told the Australian people last night what our plans are now. That's the like for like. Not the sneaking into government, small target strategy, saying that we will be a mini-me of the government and we'll just wave through the policies that we announce and come up with. And they don't come up with any costings and just think that they can sail into government. Well, that will not happen on our watch. Lani Scar. Lani Scar from the West Australian. Thank you for your speech, Treasurer. Um, this week, over the past week, five women have died as a result of circumstances relating to family and domestic violence. You obviously have a women's budget statement as part of last night's budget where you're investing more into this space, but you're also cutting money to the Australian Human Rights Commission over the forward estimates. A third of their budget is going to be cut. So how do you reconcile that? And if the election is about a choice between your budget and what Labor is going to do, who is actually going to deliver more for women? Well, the Coalition has laid out an extremely strong plan in our women's budget statement on both women's health, women's economic security, and women's safety. Um, last year's budget, as you know, uh, Lani had a billion dollars plus for women's safety, focusing on frontline services, safe houses, uh, more legal assistance, um, grants uh, to help families, uh, particularly women and children. We went even further in last night's budget. So we've actually been seeking to invest more in the areas that really count. So I think 
the policies that Maurice and Anne Rustin and Jane Hume and Bridget McKenzie uh, and Linda Reynolds um, and Michaela Cash, all the women that I sit with and the Prime Minister sits with on our Women's Budget Task Force, I think we've laid out a very strong set of initiatives. Um, I can't say what the Labor Party will do. I mean, I, I only hope this area is bipartisan, to be brutally honest with you. Um, you know, this is not an area to play politics. This is an area that matters to the most vulnerable citizens in our community. And we recognise, as part of our five and ten year um, plans, um, that this area requires much more investment into the future and it's a partnership with the states. So our focus is, I think, seen in last night's document where the money is going. It's clearly going into women's domestic violence and safety and for children particularly and it's a result of these growing areas of need. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Treasurer has to get ready for question time so I'd ask you to thank him for joining us today.